Chris Wright. I am so happy to have you on Breakthrough Marketing Secrets. Before we actually do the formal introduction, when I first met you in 2014, uh, you were practically still in diapers. <laughs> uh, it, now, less than a decade later, you're arguably one of the best copywriters in the world among those who know. And I want to just start off before we dive into everything, all the formal in introductions. What do you believe has been the biggest factor behind your rapid success in direct response copywriting? Yeah, definitely not the baby face that is under under the mustache and, and all of that still. Uh, but there's definitely numerous. And I think, you know, if I picked out two right now, firstly, let's sell the, the rest of this uh, interview, which is I, I consume content like this, like crazy, you know, every every uh, lunchtime, all afternoon, whenever I wasn't working, it was just consuming content learning lots. But no, the biggest, when um, when I hear that question, the biggest thing that comes to my mind is just staying in the game, right? Like, you know how it is, right? You take so many punches when you learn this craft, um, whether it's from, you know, mentors, copy chiefs, clients, uh, even just kind of trying to get your head around something can be torturous and like pulling teeth. So, um, yeah, yeah. You know, staying in the game, I've thought about quitting so many times and I'm glad I didn't. These are the proven direct response, marketing, copywriting, and entrepreneurship success strategies you can use today to write your own ticket and create the life you want. I am Roy Fur, and this is Breakthrough Marketing Secrets. Now here's today's breakthrough. <laughs> and we haven't even gotten into the, the torture that comes from actually putting your words out in the marketplace and <laughs> that yeah. that killing you. That's excellent. Uh, okay, cool. Well, let's do the formal introduction. I'm Roy Furrow, this is Breakthrough Marketing Secrets. And for today's episode, we have Chris Wright, uh, who is the founder and chief copywriter of yourconversion.partners. Yes, that's a domain name, yourconversion.partners, a collective of the finest minds in copywriting and marketing who create and optimize winning offers across every major niche or niche. <laughs> He's written for the yeah. biggest names in direct response, including Money Map Press, New Market Health, Angel Publishing, Stefan Georgi, and many more. Uh, and me, like through me with at least one of those clients. And through his career, he's developed copy for eight and nine figure behemoths across niches such as financial health, biz op, golf, and fitness. And so, Chris, I want to start with a really important question. How much credit do I deserve for your success for our year of working together in 2014 to 2015? Now, this is multiple choice. Do I deserve most of the credit or all of the credit? I, you know, option C, a significant amount for sure. Like, <laughs> you know, I know we're tongue in cheek there, but I, I, I never have a bad thing to say about you. And I, you know, I can kind of trace my big leaps in this business back to just a handful of people. And you're definitely one. And you were the first one, which probably means you have the most largest impact in all honesty. Um, and just going back to the, the niches and niches thing, it, it just quickly remind me of a, of a story during the time I was coaching under you. I believe um, I said the word hyperbole, but I said hyperbole. And you're like, <laughs> Do you guys say it over there? And I just played into that whole American English, English, English thing. Like, yeah, yeah, we say hyperbole. And we don't say <laughs> hyperbole. I just didn't know how to say the word. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so we stuck with me. Uh, no, uh, I guess giving, giving credit where it's actually due, uh, as much as I was joking around there, uh, one of the things about coaching that you learn through time is that winners are going to win. And as a coach, you can accelerate their progress, but winners are going to win. And you're a winner because you're a winner. And, and so I, I certainly had some level of influence and I caught you young. So I get to claim a lot of credit, <laughs> but, uh, but, but yeah, I totally respect you. And every time I see something from you recently, as far as the stuff that you lay out, as far as what works in copywriting and marketing, I'm always learning from you. Uh, which is which is super cool. So I want to cover kind of two big areas here. We're going to talk about we're going to talk about the craft of copywriting, but before that, I, I want to talk about the business of copywriting. And so, can we start by just kind of breaking down your career trajectory as a copywriter? Like, what are kind of the the milestones or uh, misadventures you've gone through? Yeah. So I think just before I became a copywriter, I, I got into the world like. 
I think many through content writing and Upwork. And I think it was like a Elance at the time. Um, yeah. So I ended up just following the money basically and getting into copywriting. Uh, that, you know, I was doing copywriting for a time as a freelancer. That's when I met you. I went to the Titans of Direct Response event, um, kind of decided to get into the financial niche from there. Um, and then, yeah, just played that game for a long time. I think three or four years, probably just, just a, a freelancer kind of gun for hire, um, writing for clients, writing with you. Um, and then Money Map Press came a calling and I went retained with them. Uh, so exclusivity on the financial side, at least. But, you know, in, in practice, they had so much work for me to do that I didn't have time to, to kind of do anything else. Um, yeah. And then chose to leave Money Map Press and began my adventure into offer ownership, um, where I became the business owner. So more than just the copywriter, I was partnered in the business. I kind of saw behind the the scenes, the customer service, the operations, the uh, traffic, all that, all that stuff. Um, and then still doing that, but now I've also moved into kind of like an agency model. You know, not an agency, but. I like to call it an agency without the baggage of being an agency, but basically I'm assembling a team of, of world-class copywriters at your conversion partners and uh, we're servicing clients there in, in kind of a different way, which we might talk about today. Yeah, let's let's talk about that in a little bit. Uh, what I want to do is, so, so you've been a freelancer, you've been kind of an employee, like, you know, a lot of people who are good freelancers and then they get recruited by a company Oftentimes we end up in something that's more of a retainer than an employee relationship, even if functionally we are employees. Mm. Um, so, so, so you got freelance, you got, we'll call that in-house, you got offer owner and you have agency. Uh, what, if you can share like big positives and negatives from each, or if there's a, you know, just a reaction to some of those roles, uh, what, what are you still excited about now? in terms of those roles. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, I, I can only speak to my, my experience, but the, um, you know, before I, I got into offer ownership, for example, you have that grass is greener kind of thinking. I've realized over the course of all of that, neither of them are inherently good or bad or better than the other or worse than the other. Uh, it's just, you know, pros and cons. So if I, if I start with freelancer, the obvious pro, why I got into that to begin with is just the freedom. You were just totally in control of that destiny. No one uh, really gets to set your schedule and you're kind of free as a bird. But then that kind of freedom comes with that downside, right? The, the con there being that you have no safety net. There's no retainer coming in every month. Um, you have, like, I remember going when I was first getting into the financial niche, going like four months without a project. And, and basically, yeah. thankfully, I had low cost of living, but, um, you know, it, it was pretty rough. Uh, moving on to in-house, obviously you get that safety net, the safety net comes in. Um, yeah. and sometimes like, like I did at money map press, you really get to work with like world-class teams of copyrights, people that really know this stuff and have a lot of, um, you know, evidence to, to back up their, their claims. Can and I, all that stuff. Yeah. Can I, can I interject a little something here? Like having yeah. gone, uh, so so like one of, one of my experiences just was with the level of uh, respect and benefit of the doubt that I got as like in copy reviews. So as a freelancer, if I went into a team where there was a good copy team in place, but I was only in the business for a project, um, I, would, I would get eviscerated in a copy review and not have not have much ground or authority to stand on like no here's why i think we should do it this way it would just like take it you know um because that's your role versus on the team suddenly you you develop a relationship and a role and your voice matters more for even something as simple as as a copy review um and and also you gather more like business intelligence about the about the business, the products, the opportunities, the customers, all of that. Would would you say that that's fair? And have you experienced something like that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, as a freelancer, I, I luckily I didn't really have to 
work with any teams as such I, I would have kind of one point of contact and, and it would be much easier that way but um definitely like understanding the business and uh and kind of yeah finding that role like when people realize that you're good at something a particular thing and they start to defer to you um you know particularly with in my kind of second half of, of money map press um we switched up the team system. So we were working with the same kind of three people, three, four people, um, you know, on every project and we'd help each other. So there was a, a deferral there still. Um, and yeah, you do, your voice gets heard a lot more. And I, I think part of that probably, you know, when it's not a one-off project, there's, they're making an investment in you. Your team is always going to make an investment in you. So they're going to listen to you and, and kind of be a bit nicer and not be too, um, picky nitpicky on, yeah. on the copy feedback cool uh so what is it like then to go from oh i'm working in-house and i'm really only responsible for cranking out copy to i'm responsible for the entire success of this business yeah right so when it came to being in-house you know one of the cons that I, just to start there would be basically not having as much, uh, you know, having to make more sacrifices and not having as much say over what you do. And so I, I, I dove in, uh, dived into, dove into offer ownership with like, that was my main motivation. Like I can be in control of more things. I can get copy out the door quicker, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. you know, take a bigger piece of the pie at the same time. And then, then you run into all those issues that you, you kind of, if you sat down, or looking back, they seem obvious, but when you're excited, you're thinking, oh, I'm, I'm not going to have any issues. I'll get in front of them, all that. And all those issues, by the way, only ever come up on like Friday, 5.30 when you're <laughs> you're tired. They, they always happen then. But um, no, yeah, getting into offer ownership, entirely different. It's so like, I can't describe the, um, the I mean, let's start backwards. So I think I still believe in offer ownership. The copy is the most important thing, totally the most important thing, but there's so many other skills that without the business doesn't work and you have to learn them. And luckily I was partners, so I didn't have to learn every single thing, but yeah, like <laughs> customer service, uh, dealing with suppliers, how, um, you know, how just a, a $2 difference on what you buy a product for, um, to them resell can, completely impact your profit margins or, or even decimate them. You know, there's so many different lessons to learn there. Yeah. And, and yet at the same time, it's like a copywriter who doesn't understand those lessons is way less valuable. I honestly, like one of the most valuable things that happened for my copywriting career was not starting in direct response, but starting in an entrepreneurial company that was doing a couple million dollars a year. And, and being inside this small team that was responsible for the total success of the business and like seeing the woman packing DVDs to go in the mail and, you know, talking to the bookkeeper, talking to the developers, talking to like all these people. And like in, in money map, I think at the time dozens, a high number of dozens of employees would be a fairly good uh, uh, estimate of the size of the total company team. So suddenly you go to offer owner and, and like those people that you didn't even think about in customer service, especially because you were working remotely, you realize how valuable their role was. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, just for people that aren't aware, I should have clarified as well that money map press is one of the Agora companies. Um, but yeah, like when, when I would go to the offices there, um, the, you would go down to the basement floor and that's where the customer service team was. And they, like they, they would all, you'd go, you'd also go down there to, um, you know, do video production and stuff like that. But you'd see the, the board that they had up of like how many calls they turned into sales and, and, and stuff like that, if I'm remembering rightly there, but anyway, like bottom line is they, they didn't just handle customer service. They also made a lot of sales added to the bottom line of the business as well. So, um, yeah, yeah there's just so much going on, like so much going on. You're, you're really just a, a cog in a machine. Um, and you don't realize that as a freelancer until you visit a client. Yeah. So you're, so you're now, it's not even going backwards. It's just shifting into a slightly different role and you're moving, um, well, I guess back towards a focus on the, uh, on the, uh, creative creation, right? Like the marketing creative creation, but doing it in terms of being an agency, um, so like there's this, this transition, what drives, well, 
you know what? I, I want to actually save that because we, we were talking about evolving the client copywriter relationship and, and we'll get to that in just a second. Sure. So before we get, before we get into, okay, so what is this new thing where this person with copywriting skills is building this agency um, instead of, you know, being in-house or a freelancer or an offer owner? Um, let's talk about some wins, like up until this point, uh, sharing what you can share, like what have been some of your biggest biggest wins yeah. yeah no when uh you know when i think about my biggest wins it's it's not just mon- monetarily although you know we'll talk about some of them in a sec as well but there's, there's a few that i'm just really proud of so one uh one's a seven figure promo that i wrote for money map press and uh why i'm so proud of this one is because uh for those that don't know the financial audience is generally considered to be a bit more conservative right and um and you know conservatives typically seen to not like renewable energy and uh this was a solar promo and i kind of just you know the 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 typical uh or conventional knowledge at the time is don't do renewable promo renewable energy sucks it doesn't resonate they don't want to invest in it but you know i i've done the research and i had i had my finger on the pulse enough to say that this is a i think this could work and you know it's gone on and done seven figures um on as a back-end promo other than that, the one that I'm particularly well known for is uh, a promo called the BioHarmony Switch. Uh, I think it's a $19 million success story now. Um, you know, yeah, they're still still squeezing it for a bit bit of a uh, bit of life as well. Um, almost two years on, so very happy with that. And you know, talking about being an offer owner, my my personal offer, Divine Locks. Um, I'm very proud of that one. Again, that is. Uh, I believe it's up around seven figures, um, if not beyond. We're we're now beginning to scale it really nicely on cold traffic. So, um, yeah, I mean, th- those are the three that come to mind. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, that BioHarmony promo. As soon as I started reading it, I said, "I need this. Like, I need to save this. This is one of those things that I'm going to keep thinking about." I, I still remember, uh, like, I have a copy of End of America. And I mean, for those who don't know the history in the financial publishing niche, this was like 2009, 2010, right after the real estate crash. And Mike Palmer and Porter Stansbury finally got this promo working that apparently they've been working on for like three or four years, just testing, testing, testing. And then it started working. And I have, I have in the file name, like $6 million plus on this promo. And it went on to do over a hundred million dollars. And, um, and, and so it was one of those where I was like, it, 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 I, I heard that this is doing really well. It's done like $6 million. Cool. And then it just became huge. Like people who weren't even in financial publishing started talking to me about it. And I'm like, I know that. <laughs> in fact, I know the person that wrote it. Um, that's always a fun thing when you're, when you get that weird crossover where yeah. <laughs> it comes back around. Uh, so those are some awesome wins. Um, so in the context, like you have some, some wins where you're the offer owner, some wins where you are in-house, some wins where you're a freelancer. Yeah. Um, what's better in terms of being a copywriter offer owner for, I, I like, I, I asked this, I guess in part financial, because we have this bias as, as we have the grass is greener bias. So if we're, if we're copywriters, we're like, ownership is better. <laughs> Owner, uh, owners were like copywriting. Don't worry about my responsibilities. That's better. So, what's your what's your what's your take here? Yeah. So you know, um, having now experienced it and done it all, it's definitely one thing that depends on the person. And so the way the way I kind of approached it, um, I, I'll, I'll always be an offer owner. I know that I'm, I'm getting to the the question eventually in my own little way. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I realized after talking to my, I have a performance coach called Monique Linda, she's brilliant. And, uh, you know, she talks about the zone of excellence and I've kind of realized through all the mentoring I do, all the copywriting I do that my kind of talent is in the, the copy achieving and solving creative challenges. Um, and so, you know, looking at it through that lens, all the kind of obligation of being an offer owner, it, you know, that's the part I don't like. And that's the part I don't have to have as a, as a copywriter servicing clients. Um, so yeah, I just want to say in that zone of excellence, I, I would definitely say grass is greener. Totally. I, I can see, um, why, 
you know, pretty much every copywriter I talk to, talk to wants to be an offer owner, but you, you got to consider all the, the extra stuff that you have to deal with as a business owner, not to mention the, um, the liability that you then place on your shoulders as the offer owner, instead of just a copywriter yeah. protected by a contract. I'm thinking specifically of a copywriter I know who, um, who was one of the first people that talked to me about, oh, you need to take your marketing skills and become an owner of businesses, uh, who was actually a partner in, uh, in an early online banking success story. And his contribution to the partnership, what got him his stake in the company was being the marketing guy, right? But he was one of eight owners. And in that regard, it was pretty a, a pretty accurate, uh, uh, I guess, representation of the big responsibility in that industry, online banking, where, you know, he could be the marketer, marketer, but he, he wasn't going to start an online bank on his own. And he needed those eight other people, seven other people Mm. to, um, to contribute in lots of different ways in order for that bank to be a a huge success. Um, Yeah, excellent. Um, And royalties, I guess, like, you've, you've been doing royalties since you started working with me uh, in 2014. That is a form of ownership that's not ownership, right? You want to speak to that? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm very passionate about royalties. A lot of, at least, at least the, the copywriters in my circle, they, um, they've got to the point where they've really leveraged their time. Uh, you know, they're charging good fees, uh, but, but most of their income doesn't come from royalties yet. You know, they're not getting that leverage. And that's, I think that's why the allure of being an offer owner is so strong. Um, you know, it, it is a, a perfectly viable and great option, but the, you know, they haven't maxed out their earning potential on royalties. And I really love royalties. Like, um, you know, you, you do $19 million in sales and you see a lot of money come into your bank account uh, every, every month. It, it's just very, it's very nice. And it's work that you, you do once and maybe you service it, you know, over a period of time, but um, it's really, you're not working harder for that, for that money than you, you are to, to write the promo in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and it, I've, I've actually been thinking about this a lot today as we're recording this, um, there, there is some work and some value that you can bring after it's written, but really so much of the work in royalties and other pay for performance type arrangements is all front loaded. Right. So, uh, 80% of the work that you do, 90%, sometimes 95 or 98% mm-hmm. of the work you do is in the first eight, 10, 12 weeks. And then you're getting paid for months, years down the road. That's excellent. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, especially it, it depends which, what kind of copy you write or, or which niche or, or niche that you write in. But, you know, um, health promos can run for two years. Some financial promos, if you, if you, if you strike gold can run for two years and, you know, if, if it takes you eight weeks to, to write a promo, um, you can write oh, at least five in a year. I'm not going to do yeah. the math very quickly there, but, um, <laughs> you know, and that, that all adds up. It's like compounding over time. Yeah. Excellent. Awesome. Um, so what don't most people get about what it takes to succeed as a copywriter, regardless of role or business model? So, I mean, you've, you've succeeded in lots of roles, lots of business models, What don't most people get about that, what that success takes. Yeah. I think, you know, the, the biggest thing is, is it's stupid, simple, but, you know, remembering that we are just writing to humans, we're talking to humans, we're dealing with humans, not people that, um, or I guess the way this plays out, right. Is that, uh, 99 out of hundred people, myself included, they get into this game and, and just kind of look for the, the shiny hack, you know, the thing that's going to kind of short circuit the consumer's brain and, and instantly make them buy the product or whatever. And that kind of leads to almost stale thinking. And again, I'm, like, I'm totally including myself in that in, yeah. in the past. Um, but when you move past that, when you get, particularly when you get the fundamentals down, when you understand like, you know, the, the strategy of copy and certain ways to write things. Um, once you've got all that down, it's all about just understanding human behavior. And again, like it's stupid simple. And I think understanding human behavior isn't something that you really read about in a book, but more something you just observe in your, well, in the data you get back from your copy, but also in your day-to-day interactions with people. Yeah. One thing I really appreciated about reading that bioharmony is it just felt like, like just a super, 
real person talking about a super real situation, super just telling a super real story. Yeah. And it like for the target audience, it just, it just clearly resonated. I want to get into the skill and craft of copywriting in a second, but uh, with the, I want to come back to the agency thing first. So you said you're evolving the client copywriter relationship with your conversion part dot partners agency. So what are you doing? Why, why is it a better way? Um, and for you, why is it also a better way than just exclusively getting lost in offer ownership? Yeah. So I guess we'll, we'll start there. So first of all, um, I, again, like I, I want to sit in my zone of excellence, which is getting offers out the door. And it, you can do them a lot quicker when you're writing for clients in my experience, at least with the setup I have with my partners um, in offer ownership. Again, like I'm not going to, I'm still always going to be an offer owner, but I want to I do the, your conversion partners um, to get more offers out the door. So basically the way I, having been an offer owner, I've now got that experience of hiring copywriters, of dealing with copywriters, of, um, you know, of, of kind of understanding the needs of an offer owner. And I realized that when I think about it, you don't really have many options when you're trying to hire as a, as a offer owner, as a business owner. Um, if you want to launch an offer or a promo, maybe you've got someone in-house or a team in-house and that's great. But a lot of companies, they can't afford to retain someone for that period of time. They don't need to retain someone. And so they go, go ahead and hire a freelancer and, you know, the typical experience, not with all, all freelance copywriters is that, um, the, the freelancer gets paid the first 50, they deliver the work, they get paid the second 50% and then they kind of vanish, you know, they, they disappear uh, or they become really hard to talk to, you know, really hard to get kind of like funnel copy or email copy or whatever out of, of them to support the promo that they've originally done. And that's, you know, that's, I think my personal theory, that's just the process. A lot of copywriters don't know how to leverage royalties yet to re yeah. like to realize that they have a stake in everything they write and should support it. But, um, yeah. you know, the, and so if we, if we look at most promos that go out the door, the reality is that they need tweaking, right. That, you know, that not much works right from the get go. Um, yeah. and so you kind of, as a offer owner, hiring a copywriter, you kind of want that, um, you know, that, that reassurance that they're not just going to vanish once you pay them what you're paying them in the contract. Um, and so you know, what, what I came up with is basically to approach those client relationships differently with your conversion partners, the clue being in the name that we kind of view every, every relationship as a partnership. And yeah. so it looks on the surface, like a lot, like a typical copywriter client kind of deal, um, kind of relationship. And in a sense it is, but it's, you know, in that the, it's a fee and royalty and all that kind of thing. But the, the partnership is, is the key word. It basically means that we care um, about your results like medium to long term. So the way we set up agreements is that the royalty isn't just because you don't just pay us that because we did the front end. You pay us that to continually support you, to continually optimize. And the kind of end result there is that we, you know, with the team I built out, especially we're able to guarantee um, or we're able to give the, the client the highest chance possible of pulling the most money from their offers. Um, and it's like, it's so subtle, but I, I think I do, th I do feel like it's an evolution in that client relationship because it's just like, it's a long, it's medium to long term. It's a partnership. It's not, it's not one and done. It's not churn and burn. Yeah. Well, and in, in so much of the potential for scale does come like after the launch. And so if you're, if you're sticking around and you're doing a test in month two, uh, or month one, right? Uh, if you're doing a test in month one, and then you have another test in month two, and another test in month three, and these are like thoughtful tests, then somewhere you push like uh, I don't know. Perry Marshall has the 80-20 sales and marketing, and he talks about it being fractal. And uh, really, on the internet, it's like 95-5, and then among the 95-5, there's still a top five percent of the top five percent that's like getting 95 percent of the 95 percent, and it, it is only in those optimizations if your funnel launches and then uh, you optimize just enough to be a little bit better than everybody else that suddenly things are wide open. I mean, you were talking earlier about you have you have an offer that it's kind of been plugging along, but now you feel like you're getting it to a point where it makes sense to scale it on cold traffic. 
And that old, like, and then suddenly that's, that's when like the, the ceiling just disappears. Yeah. Right? It's almost exponential. I mean, like the example you gave earlier with end of America being in testing for years, it's just, you know, every, they, there is a lot, like you can get a promo so close and all it needs is, is one tweak and it just goes to the moon. Like it, there's no stopping it. Yeah. Yeah. And then, then like, I mean, all the media that wasn't affordable becomes affordable. All the audiences that you couldn't get to become accessible, et yeah. cetera. So, so let's talk about your, your skill. I said, let's talk about the skill and craft of copywriting, but it came out as let's talk about your skill and craft of copywriting. Um, <laughs> I, I have a few it. of your promos in my files and specifically I'm thinking about that bioharmony one that you mentioned, and you've gotten wonderful at what I call story selling. You say storytelling and copy. Uh, it's the same thing. It's storytelling for the purpose of selling, but you're awesome at it. Um, so can we talk about like your top, I don't know, one to three lessons every copywriter should know about story selling and storytelling and copy? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, the first one would be to, I guess it's almost dispelling a myth. Um, you know, I, I do feel that there is a, I guess I know for, through my own evidence that there's a sweet spot for what makes a, a believable but dramatic story. Um, and, you know, you either fall on on one side or the other with that. You you think that your story is too dramatic or or uh, or not dramatic enough, right? And typically I've found that when I've done my mentoring and all of that, people, they don't get dramatic enough. They do very kind of overused or boring, you know, stories that aren't really going to resonate or capture someone right from the beginning. Um, yeah. And like, you know, when I, when I talk about making a story powerful enough that it, it captures people right away. The thing that always comes to my mind is that first scene in, in the first Avengers film where like Loki appears and just destroys the shield base. And it, <laughs> I, I, I remember having chills from it because at the time it was like huge. It was a combination of so many movies, like seven movies or whatever. Um, but it was just so dramatic. But, you know, get, going back to the real world, the reason why you can be a bit more dramatic than you you otherwise think you could is because crazy stuff just happens in 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 life. Um, the good example I always use is, is the movie 127 Hours. You know, that's, a, that's based on a true story. The guy falls down a, a canyon, gets his arm stuck under a boulder, has to saw it off to get out of there. They, you know, how, yeah. many, how many true stories um, have been turned into movies? And yeah, they've been embellished and, and uh, made more dramatic, but crazy stuff happens. So people are generally, if you're, if you're a bit skeptical of believability in stories, uh, generally, you can push it a bit further than you think. That would be number one. Okay. Do you have number two or three? Uh, do you have? I'm curious. I, yeah. I I have I have a reflection on your bioharmony, and I, I want to let you get to it before I spoil it. Okay. Okay. Cool. I don't know. Yeah, I might not cover that, but um, you know, I, I think uh, another. I read a lot of fantasy. I, I'm a big. I've gotten fancy. Uh, like. I can't put it down. I'm reading the Witcher series right now, and I'm always and so I'm always looking when I read a lot of this fiction. I'm looking at um, at the storytelling, and you you notice things that can be taken over into copy, and there's some things which can't. And one thing that definitely can't is how they describe like uh, every shade of plant in a meadow, for example. Like you know stuff which just isn't really relevant. It builds a scene in a fantasy world, but it it's not relevant to your copy, and so. Um, yeah, my 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 second tip would basically don't be a novelist. Most people, you know, don't really care about all that stuff. Uh, they they just want the the, the details. They want to. You need to build that story in kind of the, the minimal amount of words possible, so you keep yeah. up the momentum that comes from it. I got I I got my minor in English in college, and I was like I was all like trying to write like Emerson and Thoreau and like all this. Yeah, <laughs> all this classic American literature and all of my words were all flowery and descriptive. And then we had this guest professor come in and he taught modern short stories. And I wrote something and he like I was getting great grades in all of my writing classes. And he gave me a terrible grade in this. <laughs> and he says, all that you're doing is describing things and there is no story here. Give me some action. And and I was like, oh, and I think of that often with copywriting. Like oh, uh, you really, you really need to, like you need to write for a reader who just wants the action of an, of an Avengers film, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. that, that, that kind of has, has a bit of crossover to, to 
the third thing I think about when, you know, talking about three tips for, for storytelling. Um, yeah. and it, it's more of a philosophizing on it or whatever, but, um, you know, a good story in our, in our context of copywriting, trying to sell stuff, trying to make people take action. It, to me, it's just a Trojan horse. Like it, it's a means to implant an idea and, and inspire action, um, by getting behind the walls that we all, we all put up, right. Distrust. Yeah. I was pretty happy yeah. when I thought of that. Um, and so like for, for that same reason, the, you need that story, but you've also got to make sure it's focused. Like it can't move away from the purpose. You can't get onto too much descriptive language where your reader is less drawn into the story and, and more thinking about like uh, the cake that you were describing or, or whatever, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm, I'm like writing down a good story is a Trojan <laughs> horse because that's, that's an awesome quote. Um, yeah, so... I totally agree with that. And let me, let me actually, just as a final point on story selling, share my takeaway from your BioHarmony uh, promo. So a lot of us tell stories from like a, like a bird's eye view, right? Or like there's this, there's this novice inclination to tell a story from bird's eye view. So it's like, I did this and then this happened and then this happened. And it's, it's like a, a recounting of events. It's not storytelling versus uh, what I think of as three-dimensional storytelling, which is, and it's actually more than three dimensions because it's not just about the physical space, um, but it's, it's like you are in the room, you're in the space, and for your story in particular, it was this woman that went to her high school reunion, right, and like met an old very good friend who I don't even want to go into all the details of it, but it's, it's her experience of going back to her, her high school reunion, met an old friend, wasn't recognized like, Oh, all, and then that's like the external, but you're in the moment you're in this three-dimensional space with her. And then it's all the internal feelings, which is what makes mm -hmm. it more than three-dimensional. It's all the, like you get the narrator's reactions to it, but it's still like, it is, it is, it could be put on screen as a scene in a movie, which most storytelling that's like, I did this and then I did this and then I did this can't. And really compelling storytelling, especially for like the lead of a, pro of a cold traffic promo really needs to be something where it could be filmed as a scene in a movie. Yeah. You know, and I think, I think what you're getting to, or, or the, the way, uh, what it inspires in my brain and, uh, you know, something I think about a lot at the moment is that like every piece of copy that you write, good copy and great copy has a, a like a presence to it, right? Like, uh, yes, you know, that's like, it's a presence. It, it's almost physical. It takes up uh, like real estate in someone's brain. Like it, it kind of <laughs> like, you know, when you get those, like when someone's annoyed you and you can't, and you just can't shake that they've annoyed you and you're replaying a conversation over in your head, it, it's kind of like that same feeling. It just grips you. Um, and so, yeah, that's the way I kind of see it. Yeah, that's excellent. It, it sticks with you. And, and that's something that you never get from just like promise copy, right? Like classic yeah. uh, old advertising book. You know, this, this will make you three times richer in the next 12 months. Yeah. Like that stuff's BS. Like it's not, it doesn't resonate. Um, and it doesn't stick with you in your brain. Okay. Uh, I want to switch to, uh, you described that you've been transitioning from a template copywriter to an intuitive mm. copywriter, and that's not common language. So I want to know, like, I have a sense of what that means, but what does that mean to you? And yeah. what do you see as behind this transition? Yeah. So this happened a, a few years ago. Um, and it, you know, what, I guess what, what it is, or the best way to explain it is to kind of go through the typical process of, of a copywriter getting in and learning copywriting. And that's basically you get into the into a promo or you land your first client or whatever, and you're and then you have to write the promo and you're just like, what the hell do I do? Like, yeah. you know, how do I go about this? Um, and generally, you know, you don't know what goes where, you don't know the structure. Um, you can only guess, and if you go it alone, you end up with a a mess. Like, it, you know, I've been there a lot of time, and that's when I realized I had to find you. Um, but the you know. So then you end up turning to, to templates and there's a lot of good templates out there, uh, but they, and you know, they often work, but they can often also become a crux, uh, you know, they can become a limitation. Um, 
because not all templates work in all situations. You, you're writing copy in not in a vacuum. You have to take into account kind of like the social zeitgeist almost, the, what the prospect thinks and feels, obviously, um, you know, so much more of the cultural things that are happening right now. Um, and, and sometimes, and templates are rigid. They can't kind of bend with that in, in a lot of cases. Um, and so, you know, that, that's, so that's the template copyright. So then eventually, you, I, I believe a lot of good copywriters move to intuitive copywriting, which is to say yeah. that they, 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 once they've got down, down the fundamentals, um, you know, they're, they're competent in their abilities uh, and confident in their abilities. They kind of get into a situation like that scene at the end of the first Matrix movie where Neo is like seeing the Matrix for the first time. And instead of it being like a dark, dingy hallway, it's like the ones and zeros with the green text, like he's seeing everything. Um, yeah. And, and like, so you get to that point where you know all the pieces, you know what they are, you, you know how to put them together. Um, and you start to like, right by intuition so instead of thinking instead of looking at another promo and being like oh they did this bit there i'll do that bit there you kind of like fear that out what do i think should come next oh yeah that feels like the right thing to do and you know don't get me wrong it's not like you're you're perfect and you don't put things in the wrong places and then you you have to fear that out again and be like actually that's not right but basically yeah. you know you fill out promos and I, I honestly feel like copy gets your copy gets better for it because you're coming from a much more emotional place which is where which is meeting the prospect where they are uh, in, in an emotional place as well. Yeah. It reminds me, and I'll do a little self plug here, the master secret of great marketing report that I put together way back in 2014, maybe before we met, one of the first things you would have downloaded mm. as a new Breakthrough Marketing Secret subscriber mm. um, was about my interview with Bill Bonner, who founded Agora, now over a billion yeah. dollars a year. And he said, you know, he started as a copy, like we all started as copywriters and we are intuitive because we don't have the templates. We don't have the structure yet. Like started as a copywriter, no rules, just wing it. Right. And usually when you don't have the rules and you don't understand the rules and you've never learned the rules, your results are bad when you do that. Right. So then you figure out the rules and you start to follow rules, follow templates, whatever, and you get better by doing that, right? And then what Bill said is then at some point he started forgetting and intentionally unlearning the rules. And he went all the way back to what I try to do is at the beginning of anything that I'm going to write, I try to put myself in the mind of the prospect. And I look at the stories that I have available to me as the writer. And I say, which of these stories are interesting? What about them is interesting? And with that information, then I go back into writer mode and I say, how can I tell this, these stories mm. in the most interesting way to this prospect? And that is intuition. Like that's a description of it, intuition. And he said, it only came, it only came by going through that process of not knowing and then knowing all the rules and templates and whatever, and then intentionally forgetting them and unlearning them to allow him to move back into a, a um, informed intuition. Yeah, no, it's a, it, there's a bell curve to it, really. Uh, you yeah. Know, it, it really is it's so significant. And I think a lot of copywriters get stuck at that, you know, the peak bit uh, where they have learned the rules, but they haven't kind of internalized and, and understand where to break them. Um, because, and I think, because I think like to get between those two points, it's all, it's all about um, confidence, right? Like a very, yeah. very successful copywriter once said to me, like, to be a good copywriter, you've got to be neurotic and uh, have all these kind of like defective character traits, uh, you know, to get there. And, and one of our character traits, I think of a lot of successful copywriters that I've met is to just hate everything they write. And uh, <laughs> I, I want to constantly improve it. And so you need, like, you just don't have confidence. And so you have to yeah. develop that like, confidence or have it instilled in, in you to then get to that point where you're comfortable going, I don't need the template. Let's just crack on. Yeah. Yeah. And and don't get me wrong. I mean, I can still look over here on my wall and I see the original handout that I got from Wendy Makepeace, Clayton Makepeace's out, like pretty darn yeah, good yeah. copy outline. And uh, like, I don't need it anymore. Right. But I still keep it around, especially for the, when I get to the offer portion of a promo, because then I can just crank out the offer in a couple hours. Um, but, but all that stuff in the beginning is as much intuition as possible now. So. Um, I think that this kind of loops together the last two things, the, the storytelling and 
Um, and the character that comes out of that, as well as the intuitive copywriter, you said you wanted to talk about novelty and copy. And specifically, you said your copy and funnel has to feel different or it will die. <laughs> Can you explain? Yeah, so I, I just uh, ended up putting together like a 1500 word uh, uh, document on this that hasn't seen awesome. the light of day yet. So it's very pertinent on my mind, but it kind of goes back to what I was saying about the physical presence of, of copy. Um, you know, the way I kind of view it is that copy has its own vibe and um, yeah you know and 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 that sticks with people it just, it just it's not like they just forget about that um and so there's kind of two things to 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 establish to begin with the first is that a great quote i think it's dan kennedy not sure a buyer is a buyer is a buyer i think i first came across he's one of them marketing. yes yeah uh, yeah he's it, yeah so i think you also recommended method marketing to me um and i think that's where i came across it but the uh you know, and then, um, and then, so because a buyer is a buyer is a buyer, you go one level deeper than that. We no one buys the same thing. Um, you, you know, buys everything they see, and so they're not just a buyer is a buyer is a buyer. They're a you know a promo viewer is a promo viewer is a promo viewer. They've seen more promotions than products they bought, um, and so that's the first thing to establish. The second thing to establish is novelty that people are looking for new new solutions to their problems. Um, you know, no one is insane. They're not buying the same solution to that they've tried and hasn't helped them before. So those are the two things. Um, people have seen a lot of advertising for similar products, and they're always looking for new um, new solutions, and so. The way this translates over to copy is that, um, I mean, let's talk about the worst thing that can happen. They get there. They've never been on that web page before. Like you could guarantee that. But because you've swiped too closely or, um, you know, borrowed something from somewhere uh, or have the same story, you know, whatever it may be, it sounds the same as what they've read or seen before. And there's that kind of like, Oftentimes it's subconscious in their brain where they're going, you know, have I, have I seen this before? You know, there must've been a yeah. reason why I didn't purchase then, it, you know, it, it throws up a lot of, um, negative feelings, packets. Yeah. Feelings <laughs> that aren't conducive to making the sale and then they're yeah. gone. And I mean, the, you know, the flip side to this and why, and the kind of way we see it regularly is that, you know, a promo might fatigue and, and you'll change the, uh, the design of it just so it doesn't have that same vibe that same feel but that also applies to the copy you know the this, the music you use uh the, what the funnel even looks like what the page looks like and i'm not saying that you can't model what's working out there but the moment um the moment your copy has the same vibe the same physical presence as another promo is is just a, a horrible place to be and not because like when i say die that's probably being a bit a bit much but I think the worst place you can get to as an offer owner is having a promo that has life to it, but not enough to make you money because you hold on to it and you try so much and you invest so much resources, time, money, everything, emotion, emotional energy uh, into something which just won't work because it's got the same vibe as something else, which has already been out there for longer, seen by more uh, or has a, an edge in some kind of way. Yeah. And so, so like one of those things can just be how like the, 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 the first split second impression that somebody has of the pages that they land on. I know that I have a bias against who else headlines and I will never write a who else <laughs> headline, but it is the same thing. It's like recognizing that there are some things that are just obvious marketing copy. And, and I like to be careful not to do that. So I want to ask just a couple more really quick questions and then wrap up and give people a place to go where they can, I, maybe that manuscript is in the works for uh, the thing that we're going to talk about here. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you have a concept called the knowledge gap that you use to write better copy. So how 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 does that play into all this? And yeah, yeah. So I, I don't think I coined the term knowledge gap, uh, but it, it works perfectly. So basically, um, the knowledge gap is the point where the re your reader or viewer has been given information, typically in the form of a story, right at the start. Bear in mind but not given enough information to have the full picture in front of them, right? So it's kind of like they've been given a puzzle with most of the pieces already put together, but there's a few missing. And so they, you know, and they can't, they can't get that satisfaction of, and, and the feeling of niceness from having that uh, puzzle complete, completely filled it. And so okay. they've got, and so what that knowledge gap does is then create this huge, like curiosity. They, they need to fill in those missing pieces, uh, which, you know, these are therefore, 
um, you know, them consuming more of more of your copy. And general rule of thumb, the more of your copy that gets consumed, the the more sales you make. Yeah. So NLP has its jargon of an open loop, right? You're opening mm -hmm. loops. And we there's the Zagarnik effect, which is basically that we hold things in our mind until they are completed. So uh, the the actual original research was about people uh, about servers at a restaurant, and they could remember like who ordered what at an entire table. But then as soon as that bill was paid, and they like walk back yeah, in the kitchen, right. they completely lost that from their mind. But as until the bill was paid, until the service was complete, they their minds held that and. So an open loop is essentially creating that, like there is this thing that you now know about, but don't know enough about, right? Yeah, right. Uh, and you, you want to know the rest and that's perfect. Yeah. I mean, we are, we, we have, we're creatures that have a lot of curiosity, so it's just a way to leverage that um, and, and to get people deeper into your copy. The one thing I would say with the knowledge gap is I, I, I think I would differentiate from, from open loops. Um, just because it needs to be powerful. It's like an open loop on steroids because it's generally something you put at the front, which is going to pull someone all the way through to, you know, 30, 40, 50 minutes into that copy. Um, the, just to give an example as well, because it's definitely a bit of an art, um, the, the divine locks knowledge gap that I created, um, it, the, the story starts with, uh, a wedding and the, the mum is watching her daughter who's been married give a speech uh and she's just about to start her speech but then she crashes down into her chair crying and i i use the term um from talking from the mom's mom's perspective of all because i had made a terrible mistake and it's just a immediate like so much drama like there's so many questions unanswered but there's a specific scene still so i've been given enough yeah. information that i've got my teeth into it and that people just want to know why so they keep reading um that's Oh, yeah. they, it, it really reminds me of, I, I mean, um, uh, Breaking Bad perfected this with one of the best opening scenes of all TV series of all time with, uh, with the RV uh, scene with Walt in the very first scene of the entire series. And uh, I, it's been a while since I've watched it, but I think it, remember, it, it ends with like Walt driving in his underwear, driving this RV down the desert road. And, um, and, and you just like have to know what happened. And so then, yeah, right. then you have to watch the, the rest of the episode where it gets to that scene. And then every single Breaking Bad episode is like, what is the dramatic scene that we can end with that people have to watch until the end to get, to understand what it is. That's awesome. Yeah. They, you know, uh, yeah, I, I love, referencing like popular culture because we it's like really relatable but uh the boys i don't know if you've seen that but that's it has a similar thing where uh, it's gruesome and like I, ve I very rarely have a a physical reaction to tv but it's about superheroes in in like uh, uh where they've been kind of like commercialized heavily and um huh. right this like one of the first scenes um a guy, the main, one of the main characters is holding his girlfriend's hands and a superhero runs through her and it's like slow motion, the blood going through, like it's disgusting. And <laughs> but the, the open loop there, the knowledge gap there is where the hell is this guy running to? Because he turns around, he's like, I can't stop, I gotta go. And so that's, and that's like a, a thread that gets pulled through that entire first season. Yeah, yeah. Ah, oh, all right, <laughs> one, one more reference. I just finished, uh, just recently finished only murders in the building which is a new steve martin it's like a, a murder mystery comedy oh nice um, <laughs> uh and and i didn't i had completely forgotten about the opening scene of the entire series um but it was one of the main characters she's covered in blood hovering over this body and then and then you're just like pulled into the entire series right and that doesn't come back at the end of the first episode that's actually how the first season ends sorry spoiler alert um <laughs> it, it's how the first season ends is this this uh this same scene and you're like oh my goodness i forgot yeah, about yeah. that <laughs> but now like as soon as that as soon as you saw that scene you're like season two where are you yeah right yeah. like <laughs> Uh, so it's it's just a great I don't know these are great illustrations and what it takes to pull people's attention in. Uh, okay, do you have time for one more question before we talk about where people can go get more? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. the financial it's the financial copy question. So uh, you said that 
financial copy, you know, we we're arrogant in believing that what we're good at is, is, is the hardest, right. Or yeah, you yeah. have to be the best <laughs> to be what, good at what we're good at. But you said financial copy is the hardest, but mastering it gives you the golden key to winning in any niche or niche. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've, I've forgotten which, which way is, is the right way to say that now. As a, I say niche, but yeah. Say we, niche. Yeah. Okay. I, I cool. actually say both every time, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> Same. So yeah, no, I, I definitely think it's 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 the hardest thing. Like, um, and and the reason why is really because I you can put most other niches or niches into promos in in those niches or niches into um, into a, a fairly easy structure of of paths, right? What everyone knows: problem, agitate, solution, and variations yeah. of that. Pretty much every uh, like a relationship. Uh, products you know there's a clear problem whether it's uh how do i reignite the spark in the bedroom or how do i get my ex back um and you know problem agitate solution health i've got bad knees or uh i'm overweight problem agitate solution but you can't really do that in financial um and the reason why you know the obvious problem there is i haven't got enough money but you know and so you think it should fit has there's a problem you should agitate it find a solution but yeah. the thing is, and um, this is a total theory, um, and maybe bro science, but we've there's never been a point in our in our lives where we've had enough money. Like from from kids when we need money to buy sweets to teenagers where we want to go out and buy some alcohol to our twenties when we also want to go out and buy more alcohol. Uh, you know, third, and then you, then you start having children. You know, mortgages. There's never a point where you have enough money, and so that problem is is just not it's not new. Like it's been there the entire time. And so you yeah. can't just do like, Hey, you've got no money. I'm going to help you. If you look at financial promos, it's all about, you know, macro events or specific stocks, um, to invest in specific like technology trends, um, you know, or, or yeah, macro events, like the one we wrote about the, the Christmas massacre, um, you know, stuff like that. It, it, they're just complex. And so you can't, because you can't fit them into paths, you have to, end up creating narratives, you know, and in order to create a narrative over 50 minutes that resonates with someone to so presenting an investment story is what I'm calling a narrative. Um, you have to really have a deep understanding of people. And so that's basically why I think it's the kind of like the golden key to winning a cro- like if you want, it's so transferable because it forces you, it's such a hard niche or niche to write for and to succeed in. It forces you to understand people at a deeper level um, not just, you know, who they are, their problems, but literally how they, how they respond to certain lines of copy. Like I'll, I'll, I'll review copy and I'll see a line and I'll be like, nah, this is going to trigger something bad, even if it, but not on like a conscious level that, that the thing it might trigger in a person might not be them going, oh, I don't like this. I'm walking away, but it might just be a negative thought back in the back of their mind that they don't even recognize, but it's there. It's building up kind of like, uh, like if you're scared of flights, the anxiety in the the week before of getting on a flight kind of slowly builds up and then you recognize it because you're being grumpy or whatever. Um, yeah. yeah. So it just forces you to have a, a deeper, deeper, deeper understanding of people. Yeah. So like, and, and even, even simple things like word choice uh, and, and specifically describing, uh, I mean, there's, there's been this big trend recently Um of, of compliance related issues in financial publishing. And so everybody is having to do some updated version of past performance does not indicate future results, <laughs> all that, all that stuff pretty much tied to every single claim. And there are even ways that you can word that where you were saying the same thing, where it suddenly feels like, okay, this person is basically saying that none of their promises are going to come true <laughs> or this person is just being a reasonable uh, and, yeah, yeah. and, and you know, down to earth investor who recognizes that this is a great opportunity uh, and hopefully it's going to play out. It might not, but hopefully it's going to play out like, like we want it to. Right. Um, yeah. And, and it, mean, it, it, yeah. Well, I would say as well that like you, especially with stuff like that, uh, you learn to separate the, the logical response with the emotional response that a person has to something like, I, I mean, 
you know, the easiest way to describe that is that you'll look at like some, some part of your life that you need to change, like stop eating ice cream after 9 PM or whatever. And yeah. logically, you know, you should, but emotionally, like you can't, you just can't resist it. Um, and so it's like in your copy, you review it and it's like, logically something like it, you take a compliance thing. It, it's saying exactly what it needs to say, say compliantly, uh, to be compliant, but the emotion of it feels entirely different where, yeah, it doesn't feel like this person saying, you can't trust me. I'm useless. Like, don't believe what I'm saying, but it's actually saying, Hey, like, I'll be, I'll be straight with you. You know, I don't believe, uh, I can't guarantee the future, but you know, this has got a great chance of success. So you got to get in right now. Yes. Yes. I love it. Um, so let's, let's wrap up with just where people can go to get more from you. Of course, if they are a, uh, very high level direct marketer, do you have like any kind of thresholds for people to recognize, whether they would be a fit for your conversion partners or not. Yeah. So we, we take on hiring clients, um, and due to kind of how limited our time is, um, and also making sure we work with the right people that are serious about, um, you know, direct response, we, our packages start around 20 grand, um, and a royalty there, but the, no, the best place for people to kind of reach me is, um, is through a, a brand new sub stack that you very kindly and very smartly helped me name at taking yet more credit for the success in my life. I'll, I'll take all the credit. Yeah. Deserving me as well. <laughs> uh, no, no, I just, I just recognized the best two words that you put in front of me <laughs> and said, I like that. I like that mix. Um, but yeah, so the, the new sub stack, it's called conversion confidential, right? And yep. The link will be in the description with this episode. It's conversionconfidential.substack.com. And um, and Chris, like I said earlier, like he's one of the people that I like, even though he was a student at one point, he's somebody who I am a student of today. And uh, so I highly recommend Chris if you're serious about understanding what works in copywriting and direct response. He knows what he's talking about. And checking them out at conversionconfidential.substack.com. You can get uh, the occasional uh, public uh, public post as well as if you want to go deeper, there's opportunities for that to get even more from Chris. Yeah, well, 100%. Chris, thank you so much for being featured on this episode of Breakthrough Marketing Secrets. I, I, I loved it. I love catching up with you here. Uh, and yeah, just, just thank you. And thank you to everyone who has joined us for this episode. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you once again for tuning in to this daily episode of Breakthrough Marketing Secrets. Remember, check out the links with this episode for even more value. Now make sure you like, comment, share, subscribe, and engage in every way you can to keep this show going and growing and delivering daily value to you. I'll catch you soon for your next big breakthrough.